It's five past nine at Westmere Primary School in central Auckland. The year six kids are outside exercising, but room seven is late, and it's our fault. Before they left their class, we asked all the kids to put their lunch boxes on their desks. We also asked them to indicate with a tick those that had eaten breakfast. None of the kids had any idea we were coming. Look at these lunch boxes. The Heart Foundation would be proud. There's a mix of simple, artistic and elaborate, but almost all are healthy and nutritious. This smoked salmon and cream cheese bagel wouldn't be out of place in one of the local cafes. So of the 24 students in the class, 23 had breakfast this morning. When it comes to lunch, all 24 had a packed lunch. Two kids were also going to buy something. And when it comes to fruit, all but two had at least one piece of fruit, eight had three pieces of fruit or more. 20 minutes away is Sir Edmund Hillary Collegiate. Like Westmere School, we asked one unsuspecting Year 6 class to show us their lunches. Here they are. The picture couldn't be more different or heartbreaking. For every empty desk, there's a kid who won't be eating morning tea, who will have nothing for lunch. And don't be fooled by the chairs, they're all taken. If there isn't a bag, it's because the student doesn't have one. Six ten-year-old Kiwi kids sit at this table. Only two have lunch. And what a lunch it'll be. Imagine this throw at two in the afternoon. All four kids keenly doing their maths and spelling, hungry to learn? Yeah, right. You know, it doesn't matter how many times I see this video, it still affects me in the same way that it did when I first saw it four years ago. Um, how many of you guys remember seeing this? And I remember the very next day, everyone was talking about it, and I think, like most of New Zealand, I wasn't aware that we had such a massive problem right here in our own backyards. And I found out that 27% of Kiwi kids, that's 290,000 children in New Zealand, are currently living in poverty. That means they're missing out on the absolute basic essentials, such as um, warm housing, adequate clothing, shoes, access to nutritious food. And we estimate that there are at least 25,000 kids going to school without lunch every day. Now that to me is unacceptable in a country like ours. You know, food is not a privilege, it's a basic human right. And I believe that everyone deserves access to healthy, nutritious food every day, especially kids. Um, I was a working mum of two young kids and I didn't know how I could actually help to solve this problem. Um, I'd spent my career marketing big household brands for global food manufacturers such as um, Cadbury, Unilever, Pepsi, Heinz, Fonterra. So I knew how to market food, I just didn't know how to get food to the kids who actually needed it. Um, one night, I happened to be wearing a pair of Tom's shoes. They would have been Allbirds, except Allbirds hadn't launched at that point. Um, and I'm a huge fan of Tom's, and I really love their model. So for every pair of shoes someone buys, they donate a pair to kids in developing country. And um, that night, after a few glasses of wine, I looked down at my shoes, and I thought, well, why can't we do this for lunch? I mean, it seemed like a really simple solution, and we all eat lunch every day. So the idea is that people go online, and they order to have a fresh, healthy lunch delivered to them at work. And for every lunch they buy, we give one to a Kiwi kid in need. Buy one, give one. That same night, I came up with the name, registered the company, 
And seven months later, I quit my corporate job and with um, my business partner and renowned chef Michael Meredith, we launched Eat My Lunch from my home kitchen. Now, we um, had optimistically forecasted to sell 50 lunches a day for our first year. We had no money to market um, for marketing, and we knew this was an unresearched and unproven concept. Also, Michael was really adamant that we couldn't make more than 200 lunches a day out of my kitchen. So the first week we launched, um, we sold 50 lunches a day. In our second week, our orders went up to 200 a day. In our fourth week, we were selling 400 lunches a day. By our 12th week, we had actually hit our three-year forecast. So we did manage to make more than 200 lunches um, out of the kitchen. Um, and by using pretty much every square inch of the house. After our first six months, um, we received an abatement notice from the Auckland Council um, informing us that we had to move because we were creating too much traffic in the street and our neighbours had complained. So we moved out of home um, into commercial premises. In the first six months, we also received over $2 million of free PR um, we have since, um, at 18 months, we have actually measured our brand awareness, which was at about 50% unprompted. Uh, we now operate in Auckland, Hamilton and Wellington, and we employ 36 permanent staff. We have an expansive product portfolio, so not only do we do lunches, but um, we have breakfasts, morning, afternoon teas, gourmet lunches, um, and last year we also launched Eat My Dinner. And we, in the time, raised over a million dollars through crowdfunding. And late last year, we bought on Foodstuffs North Island as a strategic investor, which has also enabled us to start selling our lunches and dinners through their New World stores. But most importantly, um, in the two and a half years that we've been going, we have given over 700,000 lunches to kids in 64 schools. Currently, we feed 2,200 kids every day. That's 11,000 lunches a week, 110,000 a term. <laughs> now, people often ask, you know, how have we been able to do what we've done in a relatively short period of time? Uh, the first is our business model. So we are a for-profit company. We are not a charity. And I think any organization, whether it's profit or not for profit, has to be financially sustainable. I think traditional charities um, can run into problems when they solely rely on donations or external funding. As Professor Muhammad Yunus, who's the um, pioneer of microfinancing, describes it, charity is a form of trickle-down economics. If the trickle stops, so does the help for the needy. Eat My Lunch is a successful commercial enterprise. We can make money to be self-sustaining and to scale. But at the heart of what we do is our purpose. So our social mission isn't just a nice to have, it's not an add-on or an afterthought. It is absolutely core to who we are. And our buy one, give one model isn't just a consumer proposition, it's actually the way that we operate and we filter everything we do by this. So on the buy side, so that's, we call that the head of our business, um, it enables us to have really good commercial rigor and execution. And the give side is the heart of our business. Everything we do has to enable us to achieve our social mission and feed more kids. And these two things are intrinsically linked, so there's no either or. If something doesn't deliver both on both, we don't do it. Um, and this really guides everything that we do, from product design to communications, um, to re supply relationships, and to attracting and retaining people. So if you look at the product proposition, from the start, we knew we had to win and be better than our competitors, and better than anything you could buy from a cafe or a fast food outlet. So we looked at massive consumer trends around health, um, the move back to real food, 
uh, the huge increasing need for convenience and also value. And uh, since we didn't have any money for marketing research, I just went onto our competitors' Facebook pages and trawled through all their consumer comments to really try and understand what were some of the key purchase drivers and also one, what, what were some of the barriers and frustrations that customers had. One of the key um, issues that customers had with a subscription-based food model like my food bag was the lack of flexibility and the fact that you had to commit to a whole week's worth of food. So from the start, we designed a subscription service that gave, us, gave consumers the choice of how many lunches they want every week, when they actually want it delivered. And there's no minimum requirement. So we will deliver one lunch to one customer in one workplace if that's what they want. We also priced our lunches at the start at $10, including delivery. So if you compare that to what you uh, spend for lunch, and particularly in Auckland, you know, it's great value for money. But we wanted to lower every barrier possible to participation. Another thing that customers were complaining about with other services was um, the lack of variety. So our menu changes every day. In fact, we don't even tell our customers what's in the lunch. It's a bit of a surprise. Um, and the feedback that we get is that they actually really like it. So when the lunch arrives, everyone crowds around the desk or the reception area to see what's in the lunch for that day. So on the most basic level, we knew we had to deliver a product that was better than our customers, uh, than our competitors. But what makes us really different and what is the number one purchase driver is our purpose. And because of our purpose, we've been, made, we've been able to secure preferred supplier contracts with major corporates like Air New Zealand. So Chris Luxon, the CEO, um, mandated that any meeting that happens in Air New Zealand, whether it's at the board level or ground crew training, they have to order Eat My Lunch. And every quarter we report back to Air New Zealand on how many, how many lunches they've given as an organisation. And that goes up to their board as part of their sustainability programme. In the first year, Air New Zealand gave over 20,000 lunches as an organisation. Um, and because of our purpose, customers are incredibly forgiving. We, when we started, we thought we would just deliver the lunches ourselves in our one car. I mean, how hard is it to deliver 50 lunches? But in the second week, when our sales quadrupled, we had a lot of late deliveries. And there was one day, which I won't forget, our custom, one customer received his lunch at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and I was mortified and rang him. But he was so lovely and understanding. And he's actually been one of our most loyal customers since. Uh, two weeks ago, we took an 8% price rise across our whole product range. Now, not only did we have no negative feedback um, and no cancellations, our sales, the week that the price came into effect, was 70% up on the previous year. And uh, we've even had customers, a couple of customers, contact us and said that they were really glad we put our prices up. Now, in all my time working on in FMCG, I have never experienced a positive consumer reaction to a price increase, particularly in the New Zealand market. Now, um, our learning model is very much, we just do it, then we learn and adapt. So we don't have any formal gating system. This is pretty much it. It has to deliver commercially and has to deliver to our social mission. And so our MPD cycle is typically two weeks or less. And it means we can react really fast. Um, in our first week, customers were telling us that they found the portions too small in our lunch boxes. So within 48 hours, we totally redesigned the menu, um, decreased the number of items in the box, and made everything bigger. And that's how the lunch has been ever since. Eight weeks after we launched, uh, Lord, the singer, her agent contacted us and said that Lord would really like to get involved with Eat My Lunch. But she didn't need lunch herself. Um, and she wanted to give her lunch to kids as well. 
So two weeks later, she launched for us and was the first customer of a Give To product. She posted on Instagram and Facebook to about 8 million followers worldwide. And the very next day, we received orders for Give Twos from um, London, Vancouver, New York, <laughs> Sydney. Our customers aren't just the people who buy our lunches, but we also view the schools and the kids as our customers. So when I went to visit some of the schools, what I noticed was that a lot of kids were actually overweight. Um, while they're not eating a lot, what they are eating are generally highly processed and cheap foods, as you saw in the video. So the lunches that we give the kids, they're made fresh every morning, and it's jam-packed full of veggies and protein. So we have a philosophy that if it's food we won't give our own kids, we don't give it in these lunches. And I really don't subscribe to the opinion that just because it's free, the recipients should be grateful. Um, so if there's things, um, things like some of the ingredients we use might be a little bit more expensive. For example, we only use multigrain bread versus cheaper white bread. And again, it's the balance between profit and doing what is right. Um, before Eat My Lunch, a lot of the schools were also getting donated foods from local charities and other organisations. But what we found was that uh, the teachers had to leave the classrooms early, like half an hour, an hour before lunch, to actually heat or prepare the foods for the, kid, for the kids. Um, so our lunches come fully packed, there's no prep required, and they're packed in brown paper bags, so it's easy for the, kids, for the teachers to distribute to the children. The brown paper bags are also unbranded, so that it's really discreet, and it looks like something that the kids could have actually bought from home themselves. Um, at a particular school that we give lunches to in Papakura, it's a decile 1A school. So decile 1A is actually lower than a 1, which means that pretty much all of the families in the school are struggling. And the principal asked us if we could give lunches to all 165 kids in the school just to help the families out a bit. On the first day after we delivered the lunches, I rang the principal just to get some feedback on the food. Uh, we normally get really positive feedback from the kids. But on this day, the principal actually said to me that most of the kids didn't eat their lunch. And in fact, they were saving them to take home because they didn't know when they would next be fed. So food security is really important for these kids. And that's why when we bring on a school, we commit to them every single day for as long as it's required. So while we have 36 staff who makes the lunches for um, our buying customers, Every morning, we also have around 30 to 35 volunteers who come in to make lunches for the kids. Now, why would we have volunteers? I mean, we're not a charity. And, uh, and you know, people always say, well, surely once they find out that you guys make money, the goodwill's going to run out. To date, we've had over 10,000 people come in to volunteer, and we currently have a two- to three-month waiting list for volunteering. So we have had policemen, surgeons, um, doctors, lawyers, CEOs, students, musicians. Basically, anyone that can butter bread can come and be a part of it. And what I really love is that when they come in and they put on that apron, everybody is the same. And the volunteers leave knowing that all the lunches that they've made that day is going to make a difference, an immediate and tangible difference, to over 2,000 children that same day. I think this, having this volunteer side gives really great transparency to our whole process and creates huge engagement and brand advocacy. Um, our volunteers have also been a really great source of potential employees. Um, in fact, most of our staff started as volunteers, and it's a really nice screener to get people who have really great values alignment and believe in our mission. And um, because of what we do, people are actually willing to come and work for us for a lot less than the market rate. 
So just the other week, a woman emailed me or messaged me on LinkedIn saying that she would be happy to take a 50% pay cut from her current salary to come and work for us just because she wants to do something really meaningful. So because of what we do, we also attract people who are actually really in love with the idea of coming to work for Eat My Lunch. And um, they ha have almost this romanticized idea of what it's like to work with us. And sometimes they actually fail to see that there is an actual job that has to be done. Uh, <laughs> and we've, you know, generally it works out, but we've had a few problems. And what we've learned is that now when we recruit people, we have to be really clear about the expectations of a job because making and delivering thousands of lunches every day is incredibly hard work. Uh, just this week, we had a guy come in to um, interview for a role as a chef, and he said that the first thing he noticed and the first thing he felt when he walked in to eat my lunch in the morning was happiness. We have an incredibly loyal and engaged team. And most of these guys, as I said, started as volunteers. Um, they actually started with us when we were in our home. And so we are very much like one big family. Um, on our first birthday, I gave all of our guys an envelope with $100 cash in it. And they had one hour to go out and buy a gift for themselves. And then they had to come back and show everyone what they had purchased. Two of the guys in that one hour went to a tattoo parlor and um, negotiated with the owner a rate uh, from $150 down to $100. And when they came back, they had the Eat My Lunch logo tattooed on their arms. So our values aren't, don't just stay within our team, but they also extend to our partners and people that we work with. You know, when we first started, people didn't even want to talk to us. Like, suppliers didn't want to hear from us or meet us because we were an unproven concept. Um, our, the bank that we were with, and I emphasize were, um, didn't even want to lend us money because the bank manager, in his own words, told us that he thought Eat My Lunch was a stupid idea and we would never make money by giving away free lunches. Fortunately, um, we have found partners who really believe in what we do and have been willing to take that risk to kind of come on this journey with us. And for us, we don't even really have to find them. They actually come and find us. So a few weeks after we started, a Frenchman walked into the house and uh, he was the sales manager for Brink's Chicken. He had seen or on TV that we use about 60 kgs of chicken a week. And uh, he said, well, how would you guys like that for free? So not only do Brinks give us free chicken every week, which we're able to then give in the kids' lunches, last year they also ran a promotion in New World North Island. So for every two packs of Brinks chicken that you buy, um, they give a free lunch through Eat My Lunch. Now, this was a six-month promotion, and they forecasted that they were going to give us 8,000 lunches at the end of the promotion period. In the very first week the promotion ran, they were able to give us 8,100 lunches. And after six months, they gave us 50,000 lunches. And there are just so many examples of this um, with our amazing partners. So Mini does a buy one, give one on their cars for our delivery fleet. Um, Lego provides free Lego to all the kids once a year, and they also sponsor an entire school's give lunches, so we can actually bring on more schools. Cafe Le Fare heard that we were moving down to Wellington, and they offered us free space in their warehouse to build our kitchen, rent-free, for 10 years. And what do all of our partners want in return? Absolutely nothing. They are genuinely interested in helping us get to all these kids and helping us achieve our mission. And they believe in the impact that we can have on this future generation. And I think, you know, in terms of impact, probably nothing is 
better than hearing it from the kids themselves. And we constantly receive uh, letters from kids, which I'd like to share with you a few. This first one says, I'm thankful for the spare lunches you guys give because it's better than having no food to eat and let yourself starve and then walk around asking for food. Hello, at my last school, I used to stay home if I had no lunch. Now I come to school every day. My favorite, my favorite sandwich is tuna. And Max says, thanks for providing nice food. It makes me learn more and think more better. Thank you very much for doing this. I think what Eat My Lunch has shown is that by marrying a commercial business model with a social purpose, you can actually create greater value, not just for your shareholders, but for your customers, your partners, your team, and most importantly, your community. Um, I mean, let me ask you a question. If you could have a smart business which makes money and actually solves a social issue, why wouldn't you do it? And these days, I think customers and consumers are demanding more and more of this from companies. And as um, Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, the world's largest investment firm, recently wrote in a letter to other CEOs, he says that society is demanding that companies, both public and private, serve a social purpose. To prosper over time, every company must not only deliver financial performance, but also show how it makes a positive contribution to society. Our goal is to feed the 25,000 kids in New Zealand who are going to school hungry every day. And I'm pretty positive that we'll get there with the likes of you and me. I'd like to um, just end and leave you with this little video. So in my lunches, you know, it's, it takes away, it's a little, a little bit of help for a family yeah. that are already under huge, sure. huge stresses. We had a huge number of children who didn't come to school because they just, parents, you know, they were, they were embarrassed and we were sent. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So once Eat My Lunch came, it was kind of just really exciting and, and the kids enjoyed it. They really loved them. There's no, no one's embarrassed, no Sticking one's, nothing it. at all. Nothing at all. What, what we do is make sure, we, there's always a, you know, it's a core group of kids who we know um, never bring yeah. lunch and we always make sure that they're the first so we so we allocate to those children yeah. straight away and then children vary you know in, yeah, in how, sure. and who bring lunches yeah. you know depending on what's happening at home um, yeah. but there's a core group that just have it every day it's people like you and it's people like us that have to support them so we can get equity mm. thanks Expecting that. Anyone got a lump in their throat? <laughs> okay, so in New Zealand we kind of love, oh, the government will solve it. Yeah. Are you kind of saying that business can solve some of these problems? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think some of these social issues are so huge, and you know, one of the inspirations for us was actually we just didn't want to just keep talking about it, and we wanted to do something. And I think business has the uh, scale, the resource, and the opportunities to actually help solve some of these issues. What do you think it is about profit that makes inherently people disassociate it from purpose, from social good? I think, um, particularly here in New Zealand, you know, we've got this view that you're, if you're doing social good, you're just a charity. Um, and if you make money, you're a business. And the combination of the two, I think, still jars with people and they can't see how they can work together. Um, and, you know, we've heard people go, oh, well, you know, you're just using that as a marketing ploy or you're using that to get more customers. But actually, you know, a company doesn't have to do any of that good stuff. We could just be a company that sells lunches. But what's different is that we've embedded that social purpose into the heart of our business. 
And uh, that night you'd had a couple of wines. <laughs> um, you, got, <laughs> uh, you got a sense of inspiration. How did you, what motivated you to take it from an idea? What brought you into action? I think that's the hardest part. And, um, you know, it's really funny. Once we launched, I got all these emails from people saying I had the same idea years ago. Um, and I think the difference is that, you know, an idea is just pointless if it just sits in your head. You actually have to do something about it. And it takes a lot of courage to actually turn an idea into action. And particularly, um, you know, when you're at a certain stage in your life, you've got children, you've got mortgages and all of these things going on. Um, for me, it just came down to, I had two kids, I wanted them to be proud of something that I was doing, not just selling chips and chocolate to the New Zealand public. Um, and I always just kept thinking, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? Might have to sell the house, um, go back <laughs> into corporate life, but really, what's the worst thing that could happen? And I didn't want to live with the regret of not trying. Uh, I got to send a text. Do you use tomatoes, and if so, how do you not let the sandwiches go soggy? <laughs> from, Bev, from Bev and Papakura. <laughs> we do use tomatoes. That's why, like, I think it was the second bit of the question. That <laughs> That's why we've got um, an amazing chef, Michael, who kind of advises us on these little things. Um, but, you know, we put, like, lettuce on one side, ham on the other, and like, or the meat and the tomato in between. So you kind of shield <laughs> the bread from the tomato. <laughs> um, are there, uh, you know, Nick wanted to know, you know, the more kids going to school now, what are your kind of success metrics? What do you measure in the school? Is it attention? Is it health? Is mm. it kids going to school? So we get a lot of anecdotal feedback from schools and from teachers. So even just things like, um, you know, they'll say a month after my lunch is coming, the attendance is up. So there are a lot of kids go not coming to school at all just because they had no food. Um, things like that, their skin is so much better. You know, so those little things that we kind of probably don't even think about. But the challenge for us, um, particularly with this kind of social lens, is to actually start measuring some of that impact um, and get a, getting quantitative data around that. And that's what we're doing this year. And um, it seems so simple but um, powerful to, before you designed your business, to trawl your kind of competitors' um, social media posts. Can you tell me... You know, where that idea came from, what you found out, how that helped the design of the business. Is that something you do now? Do you do the same with your own uh, feedback? Yeah, so I mean, I was, the, um, I was the marketer and the customer services person when we started. Um, and yeah, like I said, we just had no money. You know, the bank wouldn't lend us money. Um, we had a little bit of our own savings, but that was being put into designing a website and buying some of the equipment that we needed. And um, as marketers, you know, just trying to, again, go from a consumer lens. And people love to complain on um, your social page. And so we just went to, like, say, my food bags um, page and just looked through all of their customer comments. And when they launched a new product, I'd just look through the comments to see what were the big things that people were picking out. What did they like? What did, what did they not like? Um, and it gave you a really good sense of what were some of those um, drivers and some of those barriers. And yeah, I still manage our social pages and um, so I sit next to customer services, so we're always listening and reacting really quickly when, um, when we see feedback from our customers. And how long did it take from the idea to, to launching the product and what's your kind of product development cycle now? Do you just have a two menus that you rotate or are you constantly at? No, so I mean variety was one of the things that we know is absolute key to re retaining customers. We just launched a new range called Simply Salads a couple of weeks ago because customers were telling us they didn't want carbs. Um, and uh, so, and they would just buy it if it was just a salad without all the other stuff. So we launched that, that took about um, two weeks, two or three weeks to launch. So really it is, you know... And what about your first product, from idea to from getting something into the school? From the very first time? Um, I think 
The idea came end of Labour weekend, 2014. Sat on it, sat on it for a couple of months. Um, and then in February, I was like, we're going to do it. And so it took four months from when we decided we were going to do it to launching. And how do you select your schools? Hmm. So we um, now have a waiting list. So we're in 64 schools, but we have a waiting list of another 60 schools. And so it's almost a first come, first serve. And when we take on a school, they'll tell us how many lunches they think they need every day, and we commit to that number every day. So there's certainty on that side. But the buy one, give one works in almost a weekly kind of um, balance. So every day we know we give 2,200. Every day people are buying, you know, variations of that number. And then at the end of the week, it pretty much evens out. And how scalable is the business? And are you constrained by geography? Yeah, so we have a kitchen in Wellington um, now. And I mean, the constraint's always just around capital. But so we've got the systems in place to scale it and to manage a lot of the functions centrally. Um, and it's also one of the big reasons why we brought Foodstuffs in as a strategic investor. So the, their ability to distribute you know, their supply chain network, um, their retail uh, network as well, will enable us to kind of get to more corners of New Zealand. Um, and is this idea of kind of social enterprise you're pretty close to it. Is mm. it just emerging in New Zealand or are you beginning to see the idea, you know, um, a little bit broader? Yeah, I think when we first started, there were definitely other social enterprises in New Zealand. I think what Eat My Lunch did was actually just um, gave it a lot more visibility and um, tried to educate the public a lot more about what it means. It's, there's still a lot of confusion about it, but what's really great is seeing a lot of young people like it from university. Um, they'll get in touch and say, I've got this idea. Um, and there's a lot more thinking around how businesses can be more socially driven. Um, and so that's quite encouraging. And obviously we had the Social World Enterprise Forum here or in Christchurch last year, which just lifted that visibility and awareness again. Lisa, mm -hmm. thanks for being an amazing New Zealander and an inspiration to us all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.